Right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about Apache Tomcat clustering. Uh, this is the agenda for this particular talk. Um, I'll give a little bit of background about myself, and then talk about some terminology, when to cluster, perhaps more importantly, when not to cluster. Uh, I'll talk about some of the components. There's quite a lot of moving parts in clustering. It's quite a complex topic. I could probably talk about it all day, and I've, I've obviously only got an hour. So I'm going to focus on what I think are the key things you need to think about if you're going to, if you're going to look at clustering. So with those components, we'll also look at some of the configuration choices, touch a little bit on debugging, um, but I'll tell you now, there's, there's no magic answer to the, some of the complexity issues here. And then we'll wrap up with questions. As always, I'm happy to take questions as we go along if you can get my attention. So, introductions. For those of you that weren't here for this morning's talk, uh, my name is Mark Thomas. I'm a committer on the Apache Tomcat project. I do various other things at the ASF as well. I'm part of the infrastructure team. I'm part of the security team, and I'll be talking about security ASF-wide and Tomcat specifically tomorrow. I do bits and pieces in the Commons project, primarily around those things that Tomcat itself uses, so that's Commons Pool and Commons DBCP, and I'm a member. My day job is as a staff engineer at VMware, where they pretty much just leave me to work on Tomcat, which is great. Um, I also help out um, on the security side, where I lead Spring Source's security team, so that's much like I do at Apache. It's managing the response to security vulnerability reports. And I work on VMware's TC Server product, which is effectively an application server built on Apache Tomcat. And as part of that, then I provide support to customers both using TC Server and Tomcat. So let's talk about some terminology. When we talk about clustering so in an IT environment, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. The Tomcat community has a very, very specific definition of clustering in mind. When we talk about Tomcat, all we are talking about is taking HTTP session information that's on one node and copying that information to another. That's it. Um, when t whenever we talk about Tomcat clustering, that's the functionality that's being discussed. And that's true throughout the code base and throughout the documentation. Obviously, on its own, that's not a great deal of use. So you need something like load balancing in order to route traffic to these multiple Tomcat instances. And that's typically done with a reverse proxy like HTTPD, but you could be using IIS, you could be using in fact, any, any, any web server that can act as a reverse proxy and can talk HTTP or AJP to Tomcat can act can, can perform that load balancing role. And it doesn't actually have to be a web server. It can be a hardware load balancer. Um, there's lots of different ways, ways of doing it. And the third bit of terminology is what's referred to as sticky sessions. And this is a configuration of the load balancer and the cluster nodes to ensure that once a client has done something that creates an HTTP session, then all requests that are associated with that session will always go to the same Tomcat instance within the group of Tomcat instances. So if, it's, if the first few requests are stateless, then those requests might be handled by different nodes within the cluster. As soon as an HTTP session is created and sticky sessions are enabled, all subsequent requests go to the node where that session was created. And it will, the client will continue being processed by that node until the session expires. So when do you want to cluster? Basically, in an ideal world, you don't. Uh, might seem like a strange thing to say in a clustering talk, but I actually think it's worth emphasizing. If you can avoid clustering, if at all possible, avoid it. Um, it's not something you want to be doing lightly. Uh, reasons why not. It adds configuration complexity. If you, can, if you don't have to configure clustering, that's a whole bunch of stuff you don't have to worry about. That's a good thing. Its very nature means it requires additional processing. Just because you've got to take updates to the session and replicate them to one or more nodes in the cluster, that requires more work to be done. It needs more CPU cycles. It needs more network bandwidth. Fundamentally, your system is doing more work. And when it goes wrong, 
it can be a lot, lot harder to figure out what's going wrong and why. Um, some of the really nasty client support engagements I really wish I'd managed to avoid have involved clustering and trying to figure out what's been going wrong and why. Um, it's not fun, it's really slow, it's often quite difficult. Um, it's much simpler to work with non-clustered environments, either um, completely stateless systems or systems that just use sticky sessions and don't bother with the replication. And that, you know, the, the, rep, the, the session replication is effectively giving you a failover protection. So if one node dies, then the session information is available on another node and you can reroute client requests to that other node and the client can carry on, hopefully without noticing that there's a problem. So the question is, do you really need that clustering capability? Um, is simple load balancing with sticky sessions good enough? So as I say, the cost there is if a node dies, the user's data is lost. How bad that will be will be t depend on your particular system, your particular environment. Um, if you've got a completely stateless application, you don't care anyway. You're not using sessions. You're not using, you don't need to worry about replication. That's the ideal, to be honest, if you can make your application completely stateless. But... In reality, most applications do require some form of state. Um, and they usually store some state, to a greater or lesser extent, in the HTTP session. Something to look at is, is there somewhere else you can pers persist this state? I mean, often it might be in, in a back-end database. So the stuff that really matters is in the backup da back-end database. And if you lose the HTTP session, the application can recover and carry on, and the user won't notice it. The sorts of environments where losing the HTTP session is just a complete no-no um, tend to be those where either there's some sort of financial transaction involved um, or there's a very, very high availability requirement. Um, they do happen. I'm, there may well be other ways to architect your application to avoid session replication. And if, when you're designing your application, I do encourage you to look at those. Um, Clustering really does absolutely have to be the last resort. There, there are other solutions that can often work, and I think they're definitely worth considering. Like I said, it seems like a strange thing to say when I'm talking about clustering, but it adds sufficient complexity both to configuration and particularly debugging that I really do want to emphasize the point, have a look at what your other options are. But let, let's assume that you've looked at your options. Um, there's enough of you in here to, to listen to me talk about clustering that some of you are interested in it. So let's look at um, the clustering components. This is a diagram of all of the various components that are involved in clustering. And there's quite a few of them. And all of these appear in server.xml and they're all documented within the Tomcat documentation. I'm going to talk about um, some of them in a little bit more detail than others. Some I'm going to gloss over quite quickly, but say there is a lot more detail on this in, in the docs. So you've got the overall cluster component, and it's effectively responsible for making sure that the HTTP session data gets replicated somehow across the cluster. The first component is the manager. And really, it's the manager that does the, the orchestration of this, and it's the manager that decides exactly how the data is going to be replicated. We'll talk about this in a bit more detail later on, but there are essentially two implementations that have different replication strategies, and you are free to use either one of those or, in fact, implement your own if you so desire. Moving on from the manager, we've got the channel and its various subcomponents, and it's the channel that is the communication mechanism. It's the channel that takes care of getting the replication messages from one node to the node or nodes that those messages need to get to. So one part of that is the membership, and that's how that manages knowledge of what are the other nodes in this cluster. Because obviously in order to implement some form of replication strategy, you need to know what the other nodes are so you can decide which nodes to replicate your data to, and that responsibility falls to the, the membership component. Then you've got the receiver and the sender, which unsurprisingly, the sender sends messages and the receiver receives messages. 
And on those, you've also got interceptors. And they're a bit like servlet filters in that they can intercept messages on the way out and they can intercept messages on the way back. They can insert messages into the chain and they can remove messages so they don't get further down the chain or don't get further up the stack. So for example, one of the simple interceptors just keeps a um, running total of statistics about how many messages have been sent, how big they were, that sort of thing. There are um, other interceptors that do things like monitor the health of other nodes in the cluster. The next block of components here are the valves. Now, valves are um, also, as it happens, like, a bit like servlet filters, but they're Tomcat's specific version of a servlet filter, and a valve can sit on any container component within the hierarchy, so they can sit on context, they can sit on hosts, and they can sit on engines. And because we're talking about the clustering, which is either done at the host level or the engine level, then whatever valves are associated with the cluster, they will get injected into the processing pipeline of the associated component. So if you have a cluster attached to a host, then any valves for that cluster will get inserted into the pipeline of valves for that particular host. And the sort of thing that the valves do is, for example, if the um, session ID changes, for example, because you're using sticky sessions, you have a failover, the JVM route on the end, that changes, then the valve makes sure that Tomcat's internal data structures are updated with that new ID. Uh, next component is the deployer. Um, this is something that isn't that widely used. Um, the reason I know this is for a long time there was a, there was a rather fundamental bug in the deployer in that it made the rather inaccurate assumption that all messages it received were, were uh, received in the same order it was sent. And the job of the deployer is to take a WAR file and deploy it across all of the nodes in the cluster. So obviously the WAR file, particularly if it's a big one, gets broken down into multiple messages. That gets sent out across the network. It's reconstructed at the other end. You build the WAR file and deploy it. If those messages were reconstructed in the wrong order, obviously you ended up with a corrupted WAR file. Um, and that was the case for quite a while, and nobody actually complained. Um, when somebody did finally complain, we fixed it. Um, but it does suggest that it's not that widely used. I think I probably see about maybe one, two messages a year on the users list about it. So it is a fairly infrequently used component. Most people just, when they have a cluster, they'll just manually deploy the WAR files they want to that cluster. They're, they're not dynamically deploying and undeploying WAR files from a cluster. Um, and finally, there's the listeners components. And there are various events that are generated within the cluster. It seems like message received, message sent, um, a node has, has disappeared from the cluster, a new node has arrived. Lots and lots of different messages that you can write a listener um, to respond to and do something when that happens. Um, and Tomcat has some internal listeners as well that do some of the, um, some of the work of the cluster based on other events. So let's look at configuration choices for some um, but obviously not all of those, those components. First of all, the manager. As I said, there are two options. They're referred to as the delta manager and the backup manager. And the backup manager, it happens, is really the, the motivating factor for me um, submitting this talk to ApacheCon, because there, there is a lot of misunderstanding over what the backup manager actually does. And one of the things I wanted to do in this presentation was try and clarify that. But before we get to the backup manager, let's talk about the Delta manager. That is the default manager within Tomcat. That's the one that you get if you just put a cluster element in your server.xml. And its replication strategy is really simple. It's going to replicate every change in every session to every node in the cluster. So that gives you maximum reliability. If you've got four, four nodes in your cluster, three of those nodes can fail. And in theory, you will still have all of your sessions on your remaining node, assuming that that node actually has enough memory to handle all of them and enough processing capability to handle all, the, all of the requests. But it does give you maximum reliability. It does have an incy teensy tiny downside when it comes, comes to scalability. And that is that the number of um, messages on the network or the, the volume of network traffic increases with the square of the number of nodes in the network. Um, that is not sustainable. Um, you rapidly run out of bandwidth if you have a fairly busy cluster and a large number of nodes. Um, I 
reckon on the limit being somewhere between four and eight nodes, depending on how big your sessions are, how big the objects are that you're replicating, how busy the site is. Um, you can sometimes get away with eight, four, you, you're usually okay with it. It is very application specific, but um, it doesn't scale to really large numbers of nodes or, or really large sessions. Um, the, one advantage of it is the failover can be to any node. So if you've got four nodes and node A fails, any of the other nodes can immediately pick up the request because they've got usually all of the session data. And we'll come on to it exactly when they might not have all of the session data a little bit later on. The backup manager is not, and I stress the not as some people have described, um, it does not have one node that keeps a backup copy of every single session. That is not how it works. The way the backup manager works is a, when a session can be created on any node in the cluster. The node that the session is created on becomes the primary node for that session. That node then picks a backup node, it's actually on a round robin basis, from one of the other nodes in the cluster. So node A, first of all, when it needs a backup node, it will pick node B, then C, then D, then back to B, C, D, B, C, D, and so on. So in our four node cluster, if node A is our primary and node B is our backup, nodes C and D have no session content at all. Um, what this means is that you have to use sticky sessions because you always need the requests to go to the primary node in the cluster. If you don't, the cluster starts trying to reconfigure itself thinking that the primary node has gone down. So if you're using the backup manager, you absolutely have to use sticky sessions. In terms of scalability, it's a lot more scalable because there's effectively only one copy of the data, then the network traffic scales with um, just the number of nodes. So it's linear scalability, so it, you can scale it out to much larger numbers. Failover, however, is a little bit more complicated. Uh, and again, particularly if you're trying to debug what's going on around failover situations, you need to have a good understanding of how the backup manager works, and that's what we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail next. So let's start with our four-node cluster. Um, each node has got 30 sessions on it that are primary sessions. And typically, and in a, in a real-world application, they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't be distributed this evenly. There'd be, a, there'd be a few little ups and downs. But roughly, on average, for those 30 primary sessions, they'll be distributed 10 on each of the other three nodes. So node A has got its 30 primary sessions, and its backups are distributed 10 on B, 10 on C, 10 on D. And the same for the other nodes. So when you look at it in total, each node has 60 sessions. It's 30 primary sessions and 30 backup sessions for other nodes in the cluster. So we're using sticky sessions here. So for, node, for a session that's in node A, the client will talk to that node. Any updates to those sessions, they will get replicated just to the backup node that's got the copy of that session. Now let's imagine that node D fails. Um, a lot of things start happening, and they start happening as soon as the cluster notices that that node has failed. Uh, that they are not dependent on a request coming in, although a request coming in can actually trigger some of this as well. And to add to the um, entertainment, shall we say, of trying to keep track of what's going on, each of those three remaining nodes are independently going to start recovering from the fact that node D has just failed. So what's going to happen? The short version is that the sessions are going to be distributed to the other nodes. Um, however, things are complicated by what actually triggers that redistribution and what happens when. So, let's, node D has failed, and the other nodes in the cluster notice, okay, we'll assume that there are no requests coming in at the minute because that just helps keep things simple. So the other nodes notice that node D has failed. It says, right, was I the backup for any of node D's sessions? Okay, for all of node D's sessions that I was the backup for, I will make myself the primary and announce that to the other nodes in the cluster. 
it will then say, right, I know I was the backup and I'm now the primary. That means there is no backup for these sessions at the minute. So the next thing it will do, it will, again, on a round-robin basis, select a backup node for these sessions and then replicate that data out to those other nodes. Um, Okay, now, things are slightly different if we look at this in terms of a request comes in. If a request comes in, the load balancer will redistribute to that, that um, request to another, to either A, B, or C, but it doesn't know which was the backup node for that session. So it, it's got a one in three chance of getting it right. If it gets it right, that's fine. Everything's hunky-dory. The, the node that it selects that's the new primary, everything carries on as it was before. If it gets it wrong, whichever node it selects then starts making itself the primary node for that session. And that then means that it needs to select a new backup and, and, and so on. Um, something I should have mentioned a little bit earlier and I didn't. If, although the, a node will only keep its own sessions and copies of its backups, it also has a list of every single session across the entire cluster and which node is primary and which node is backup. So if a session, if a node receives a request for a session it knows nothing about, that it's not the primary for and it's not the backup for, it still knows which nodes within the cluster are the primary and are the backup and it's able to go to the primary and say, right, excuse me, uh, I'm now the primary, I'm taking over that session, please send me a copy of the data. So you've got these two processes going along in parallel. The load balancer is redistributing the requests to the nodes, and that is triggering changes in which is the primary and which is the backup. And the cluster at the same time is, has noticed that the node has gone down, and it's also redistributing the sessions. So it can take, after a node failure, a little bit of time for things to settle down again. You will see spikes in CPU usage. You will see spikes in network traffic. And you need to allow some headroom for that to happen. Again, how much headroom you need is going to be application dependent, and that's something that you can um, track and, and investigate in sort of your development and your QA environment. So where we end up with, uh, once things have settled down, again, roughly, you know, there's, there's going to be little statistical anomalies here, but we've now got 40 sessions in primary on nodes A, B, and C, and node A will have 20 backups of B and C, B will have 20 backups of A and C, and so on. So we've now got 18 sessions, effectively, on each node in the cluster. 40 primary, 40 backup. Um, I'll mention at this point, if you want to know which sessions are primary, which ones are backup, and where they are, the Tomcat Manager application will identify a session as a primary, a backup, or a proxy. So a primary is obviously you know, the one that's currently in use. The backup is the backup copy. A proxy session is essentially just the little marker within the node saying, yeah, I'm not the primary, I'm not the backup, but I know the primary's over here and the backup's over there. So when you look at um, sessions in a clustered web application in the manager, if you're using the backup manager, it will tell you whether it's a primary, a backup, or a proxy. So that's the manager and the choices you've got to make there. Um, next, I want to go on and talk about membership and how you track this. Again, there are two options. You can either use multicast or you can use static definitions. Multicast membership, which again is the default, that does require multicast to be enabled in the network. Um, and if it's not, then it's obviously just, just not going to work. Personally, it's something I find quite difficult to debug um, when it's going wrong. I just haven't quite got enough experience to drill down really quickly to what the problem areas are, so it usually takes me a little bit of time. Uh, one of the um, things that has changed recently, or well, I say recently in the last few years with multicast, is as you see organizations moving to more virtualized environments, they often set up, well, we're going to set up our own little virtual subnet for this particular application. And because the application is on its own virtual subnet, there's normally less of a reluctance to enable multicast on that particular subnet than there would be if you're trying to, if you want, you're asking it for it to be enabled across an entire corporate IT structure. So I have seen a, um, a greater willingness to use multicast in, in corporate environments over, over recent years. One of the big advantages of multicast is it scales um, more easily. If you want to add a new, new member, 
you just configure the node, it starts up, it announces itself to the other nodes, they see it's there, they announce themselves to it, and in theory, and it usually does if multicast is enabled, it just works. Whereas static membership, which doesn't require multicast, it's, it's a lot simpler to debug because it's just a simple TCP connection to all of the other nodes which you've, all re you've told your current node exists, so it creates connections to each of them to make sure it can talk to them. The downside is adding nodes gets time consuming. It's okay when you've got one or two or three, but when you've sort of got your eight node cluster and you want to add another two, you've now got to go to each of those eight instances and add another two static membership entries to each of those and then add the nine instances and get them all the right way round to the two new nodes that you've just created. And as the number of nodes go up, it just gets a little bit more complicated and a little more painful to manage. So in the past, I've had a preference for static membership because it's been easier to debug and it's met less resistance from sort of corporate IT. These days, my preference is for multicast, um, primarily because it's just easier to, to scale out and add additional nodes as you need to. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about are send options. Now, this is one of those things that I keep thinking, yeah, we really should change the way this is configured. It's not very consistent, um, and I've just never got around to doing it, and it's something we'd really need to do on a, on a major release. If you're using the Delta Manager, what you're really talking about here is the channel send options, which is on the cluster element. But if you're using the backup manager, you actually need to configure the map send options, which is on the manager element. And to my mind, those really should be on one element, cluster, manager, I don't really care which one, pick one and use it consistently between the two. Um, but we don't, so that's just something to be aware of. And really what the send options are controlling are whether or not you send messages for session updates across the cluster in a synchronous manner or an asynchronous manner. So for synchronous, what this means is that the request processing will not complete until the session update has been sent to all of the other nodes in the cluster. Now, that's sort of for a given value of sent, which can actually mean various things depending on how you set, set your send options. It might just be, yep, yeah, I've written it to the TCP stack. I've got no idea whether it's sent it, no, but I've written it to the TCP stack, that's good enough for me, I'm carrying on. It might mean, okay, I've sent this message to the, to the other nodes in the cluster and they've all acknowledged that they have received it. Well, that's obviously a, a level up in terms of assurance. Beyond that, there's the, okay, I've sent this message to all of the other nodes in the cluster, they have received it and they have processed it. So if we're talking about updating a session, that means, okay, I've sent the updates to all the other nodes in the cluster, they've all received it, they've all updated their local copies of the session, so now all of the sessions across the cluster have the same view. Now, if you're using synchronous send options and you choose the option of they must, any all messages must have been processed by the other node, what that means is once one node in the cluster has processed a request, then the next request can go to any other node in the cluster and it will see exactly the same view of the HTTP session regardless of which node it goes to in the cluster. If you're using asynchronous messages, and that essentially means the message gets put on a queue and then the response goes back to the client, you've got no idea whether the message has been sent or not, then the next request that's received, if it goes to a different node in the cluster, it might see the session update or it might not which then comes back to why you'd need to use sticky sessions to make sure that you see the updated version of the session. So there's actually some interesting decisions to be made here. If you want, if you don't, for some reason you don't want to use sticky sessions and you want to make sure that when a request, after a request has been processed, the next request sees the updated session, you have to do things synchronously and you have to choose the must have been processed by the other node option. To some extent, all of that, to my mind, is um, somewhat academic because browsers have this nasty habit of sending parallel requests, which kind of throws everything I've just said out of the window somewhat. Um, and generally, I find that for, to get a consistent view of the session, you end up having to use sticky sessions regardless. <coughs> 
but it does depend on exactly which requests need to see the updated session and how your application is structured and exactly what those requests are and what they're for. Um, if there's only ever one dynamic resource and the other things sort of static bits and pieces, images, JavaScript, then it's the parallel requests become less of an issue. Um, one other thing just to mention on the asynchronous front, one of the, one of the um, features of processing the messages asynchronously is there, no, there is no guarantee they will be processed in the same order they are sent. So if you send out a message that says increment counter to one, increment counter to two, or set counter to one, set counter to two, set counter to three, which might just be the result of some in incremental action, it's possible that the updates might be processed on the, on the receiver side as set value to three, set value to one, set value to three, set value to two. And therefore you then don't have, again, have that consistent view of the updates across the session. So something else to bear in mind, and again, people tend to fall back to the, the synchronous approach in order to avoid that. Um, so in summary around the configuration choices, for the manager, you need to choose the delta or the backup manager, so which, which uh, um, replication strategy do you want? Do you want sticky sessions or not? Um, I would strongly recommend the answer to that question is yes. Membership, multicast or static? That's a little bit driven by your environment, how big your cluster is, but I, I'd lean towards multicast for that if possible. And send options, synchronous or asynchronous. And your choice there depends on you know, how sure do you want to be that messages have been replicated across the cluster, um, and how important it is, is it that you have an absolutely consistent view and that messages are processed in the right order. And the answers to those questions are really going to be very much application dependent. There are some applications where, yeah, messages process in the wrong order, actually we don't really mind very much because it'll, it'll get corrected when it processes the following message. So if the information is slightly out of date in a backup, yeah, not a problem. Let's move on to debugging. There are really sort of two aspects to this. Um, so sort of you, you can view them as the relatively easy one and the, and the relatively difficult one. The first bit is actually you've got a cluster configured and you... You want to make sure it's configured the way you think it's configured, and you want to make sure failover and things are working the way that you think they should work. So this is sort of your, your new installation. You set up your four node cluster or your eight node cl cluster, whatever it is, and you just want to test that it behaves the way you think it, it's meant to behave. Um, and really, in order to do that, when you send a request through the load balancer to the cluster, what you really need to know is what's the session ID, um, which backend node handled that, um, what's the route which should match to the right backend node, and you might have other information as well like, you know, is some test value that I put in the session still present? And I have a very simple JSP that I use to test this sort of thing. Um, I just set up a cluster, I deploy this JSP across all of it, and then I make sure that the cluster behaves the way that I want it to, and it just shows me, you know, what's the current um, session ID, that gives me the session ID and the route. Um, what's the IP address of this, the current server? That tells me which physical node is handling it. Um, and I've also got some stuff that lets me pop um, attributes into the session, and it basically just dumps any attributes that are currently in the session. And it's a sort of JSP page that you can throw together in about five minutes, but it makes debugging cluster configurations a whole lot easier. Um, so the sort of thing I might do is turn off sticky sessions and then just check that it round robins or whatever my load balancing algorithm is around all of the nodes in the cluster to make sure that they're, they're all serving requests and the load balancer knows about all of them. Um, the next thing I normally do is turn on sticky sessions and make sure that works. Um, and then you can start testing failover. So I'm, I'm happily using node A. If node A fails, I'm, do I move over to node B or whatever I expect? Again. The, the behavior you expect will depend on how you've configured your load balance, but really what you're doing here is making sure that the behavior is as expected. Um, you do need to keep in mind how your reverse proxy is configured to handle failed nodes, and there are a couple of gotchas here. Um, the first, um, and I'm, I'm gonna talk about this in the context of HTTPD. If you're using HTTPD and mod proxy, if a backend node fails, then mod proxy will return a 503 error to the client. End of story. I tried to contact that node, that node's down, 503 comes back. Mod JK, you can configure it to retry the request to another node in the cluster. 
Now, that is potentially quite a nice thing because the client doesn't see the error message. The request just gets retried and um, the user sees the response. And they will see a slightly slower response because there are some timeouts involved. Um, but that's potentially a good thing. But it does mean that potentially your request got sent to one node in the cluster, it processed it, and something went wrong when the response was being sent back. And now you've just sent the, no, the request to another node in the cluster, and it's processed it again. Now, take an extreme example. If this is a banking application that's processing a deposit for $1,000, you've just had $2,000 deposited in that particular account rather than 1000 Now, as a user, I'd be quite happy about that, but I'd be less happy if we were talking about a withdrawal. So there are things that you need to bear in mind, and ModJK has more knobs for you to twiddle to configure this behavior than you would believe imaginable. And they're all documented on the website, and you can control how you handle, you know, do you do it for just get requests, do you do it for post requests, do you do it on particular error codes, what the timeouts are. There's lots and lots of control, and it's one of those areas where ModJK has finer grain control over the behavior than is available through, through ModProxy. The other thing to bear in mind is that the reverse proxy, once it's tried talking to a node and it's decided that, oh, that node has failed, it usually sort of marks that node mentally as failed for a period of time. I think by default it's 60 seconds. So if you're doing a quick cluster test where you've got, say, four nodes in a cluster, you take, take node A down, great, I bounce to node B, take node B down, great, I bounce to node C, take node C down, great, I bounce to node D. Right, let's turn, turn all the other nodes back on, take node D down, and I get a failed request. And the reason for that is if you've done it quickly enough, if you've taken all four of those nodes down within 60 seconds, your reverse proxy thinks, well, all of the nodes are down. I'm not going to retry talking to any of them until 60 seconds after I know that they failed the last time, and at which point all of your requests start failing, which can be a little bit surprising. So again, it's all about remembering how your reverse proxy is configured to handle those failures, and then make sure that your testing takes account of that. So that's sort of debugging your cluster configuration to start with to make sure that everything is working the, the way you expect. The more complicated problem is debugging application problems. Um, it's, in some ways, it's just like debugging any other application problem. The downside is it's harder um, because you've got a lot more moving parts. You're less sure about where things are, which particular node is processing it, where's, you know, where do I need to go looking for error messages. And it gets really tricky if you're talking about, well, we only see this problem if one of the nodes fails, and then not all of the time. Trying to figure out what's going on in those situations can be very difficult. I don't think really there's a, a foolproof, oh, you just do this and you'll always be able to find the problem. Um, I wish there was, if there, you know, and if there was, I'd share it with you, but unfortunately there isn't. And the first thing I normally look for is, you know, can I reproduce the problem without the cluster? If I can take that particular moving part out, out, of the, out of the problem space, great. And to some extent, it, it's like any other problem. What you're trying to do is reduce the issue to the simplest possible, most reproducible test case you can. You can. Um, so taking, looking at it a little bit more generally from a Tomcat point of view, I really like bug reports that come with war files with source code that say, stick this on a Tomcat instance, go to, this index, go to the index page, click this link and watch it fall over. Because that's great. That's dead easy to reproduce, dead easy for me to debug. Um, bug reports along lines of, yeah, Tomcat sometimes fails. Great. In what way? Oh, well, we've got this stack trace. How do you trigger it? Don't know. How many do you get? Well, it, we get about once every two months. Right. That sort of is a lot harder to do because you, you, you can't reproduce it. You can't do the sorts of analysis that you'd normally do. So as always, simplest possible test case is what you're aiming for, and getting rid of clustering is the first thing I would try and do. If you're having network or failover issues, then one of the things you, that I find is very useful to look at is look at the access logs. And at this point, it's kind of critical that the access logs include the session IDs, because the session IDs will include the JVM routes, and then you can use that to match up, well, this request should have been handled by node A, so I can go and look at node A's access log. Does that actually appear in the right place? Yes, it does. Great. One of the things to watch out for is when access logs are written. Um, 
the, the very nature of an access log entry is it can only be written once, once the request, once the response has been generated. So it can include things like the, the, the length of the response, how many bytes were written. Uh, that does mean that if a request fails and something times out, and your timeout is, say, 20 seconds, then the, the entry for that request is actually going to appear 20 seconds further down the access log than when the request started. So you do end entries in access logs are not necessarily in time order of when the request started, they're in time order of when the request finished. And you need to remember the timeouts when you're looking in your access logs to go looking in the right places. That's caught me out a few times. I've thought, there's nothing in the access logs. Where's it gone? Yeah, and I trawl through it and I eventually find it 20 seconds later. And then I realise what I've done wrong. Um, and that applies to both HTTPD and Tomcat. Um, or if you look at the access logs, look at the error logs. Um, there might be something uh, useful in there. There have been cases where I've basically had no choice but to look at the network traffic, which involves, right, get out TCP dump, um, load up a copy of Wireshark, and stop trawl start trawling through huge amounts of data. It's not pretty. It's a lot easier if, you, if you've got the sort of problem where well, we don't quite know what's going on, but we know if we let the users hammer at this system for 15 minutes, we're going to get a couple of these failures. That's the sort of time where you know, if there's nothing in, nothing in the access logs, nothing in the error logs, nothing obviously going wrong, that's when I might get out TCP dump and they say, well, the user can tell me when it fails, so they can tell me their IP address and the time, and then I go looking and I can find the TCP stream where it went wrong, and then that might give me some clues as to what's happening. And I've, I've successfully done that a couple of times, and it's hard work, it's, it's slow going, but you can get there. Um, and the root cause of the problem there was a um, Internet Explorer taking advantage of some unofficial Microsoft not quite following the HTTP specification features and passing them on to HTTPD that was saying, <laughs> no, that's not spec compliant, thank you very much, go away, and just resetting the connection before it even got anywhere near the access logs. But it was only by looking at the, the network level dump we could actually see what was going on. Um, so to some extent, those, those network issues are a little bit easier to, de to debug because at the worst case, you can look at the raw traffic and figure out what's going on. And it, it, it's sort of, a, sort of a heavyweight approach, but it is there as a, as a route of last resort. If you've got application issues, then it really comes down to logging, logging, and more logging. The better the logging that's available from your application, the more likely you're going, you, you are to be able to figure out what's happening. Um, and you need to be able to fine tune it. You need to be able to narrow it down to, okay, this is where the, this is where the problem is. It's this particular feature. It's this bit. Um, again, if it's repeatable, and if you can, um, then my, my sort of starting point is, can I attach a debugger to that Tomcat instance and put a breakpoint in? Oh, I can. Excellent. Right. L life suddenly got a lot easier um, because now I can just sit there waiting for the problem to occur and then I can step through and see exactly what's happening. If I can't do that and I'm trying to do everything via, access, via application logging, it gets a lot harder. Um, it's kind of at this point you really need to make sure you've got application developers that really understand the application code working alongside you so they can say, oh, yeah, no, you know, they, they've got the understanding of the application architecture so they can focus in on the right bits. Trying to do this without the knowledge of the application is really, really painful. Okay, um, that brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk about. I'm obviously happy to take any questions, and I think we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Yeah. Do you want to step up to the mic so we can get it for the recording, please? So my question is basically uh, when you talk about failure in the context of a cluster, mm -hmm. um, what's the, the actual formal definition of a failure? Does it fail a ping test? Does it fail? What, what are the conditions that um, this would be considered a fail? Okay, so the, in terms of the conditions, the sort of failure conditions for a node, it's actually something that you configure within the, the load balancer. So it might, it's normally of the form, I've sent a request to that node and I haven't had a response back in X seconds. It might be I've had a 500 error code of some form and I'm going to assume that that's, that's fatal. It usually isn't, but I'm going to assume that it is. Um, normally the sorts of things that go wrong are things like 
um, get an out-of-memory error on the JVM that's running Tomcat. Yeah, that's 99 times out of 100, that's instantly fatal. Or you get a JVM crash, and it just, the process just disappears, and the load balancer sat there waiting for a response. So normally, it's request has taken X seconds to, more than X seconds to come back, and it hasn't. That does mean that things get really complicated if you have an application where most requests should come back within a second, but the odd request might take a minute or more to process. Suddenly your timeout has to be a minute or two minutes. So that means even if one of the simple requests fail, it ends up sat there spinning for two minutes. So you, the more responsive you can make your application in those scenarios, then the easier it is to set up your, your, sort of your failover configuration. Um, really, you, you want to avoid those long-running requests. You want to use some other process. You know, basically kick them off as a background process and check for results periodically, that kind of thing. Um, so really, the, the definition of failure is whatever you define it to be in the load balancer. And again, ModJK has more fine-tuning available than ModProxy to do that. OK. Yes. Uh, are there any uh, disadvantages to using Deployer or any gotchas that you can um, are there any disadvantages to using the deployer within the cluster? Um, the documentation isn't great. Um, it definitely works. Uh, I, you know, w when I fixed the message order problem, then I, I did a bunch of other testing as well, and it, it, it all works. The documentation, documentation could probably be a bit better. But other than that, if you're happy using it, go for it. I think I'd be a little bit wary of using it in production, but then again, I'm generally wary of doing any form of live depo deployment in production. Uh, one thing I will add is that it has been tested with um, Tomcat's parallel deployment feature. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, that lets you deploy multiple versions of a web application in parallel, and sessions that are associated with the older version will carry on being processed by that older version, and new sessions will be processed by the new version. So it's a way of doing application upgrades without having to sort of drop users that are using the, the old version of the app. And a more recent addition is you can actually get Tomcat to automatically undeploy the old version of the app once all of the sessions have expired. And that parallel deployment works with the cluster deployer as well. That's also been tested. Um, I have a question about the memberships. Um, mm -hmm. So, what if, like, the is there first of all, is there a leader concept of any sort? And second is, what if, let's say, the node D comes back up, but maybe it's in a little bit of a network isolation among the other nodes, but still okay with the from the load balancer perspective? Um, so, how does that get handled? Okay. Um, yes, there is a concept of leadership, exactly how it works, I would have to read the source code but um, to remind myself, because I, I, it's not something I've actually done a huge amount of work on. Um, I remember seeing the word leadership in a comment somewhere, but beyond that I'd have to look through the source code to see how it's working. In terms of um, different views between what the load balancer thinks is working and what the cluster thinks is working, one of the issues with um, Tomcat's clustering implementation is that there is a disconnect there. They have two completely different views of the world. Um, they're usually aligned, but they might not be. Okay. Um, if you want them to be aligned, then uh, one of there is a mod cluster uh, written by the JBoss folks at Red Hat, and that tries to get communication from the cluster back to the load balancer to inform it when nodes go up, when nodes go down. Um, it's not something that I've actually used, but I know it's there and it's used by others. So that tries to have a more coherent view of what the state of the cluster is. It's one of the thing that, thing that's been on the to-do list for Tomcat and Mod Proxy and Mod JK for a while, but nothing's actually happened yet. So um, uh, along the same lines, so you know, other Apache projects like Zookeeper and stuff do things like you know memberships management and things like that. Is a Tomcat you know, using the same code base, or is it a totally different approach? Or, I mean, how is that? Okay. So it's doing what form of management? Like the membership management uh, and the cluster management. Like, you know, there are other projects in Apache, <laughs> you know, probably spending a lot more resources on those kind of issues. Uh, yeah, uh, Tom, the Tomcat cluster implementation has been around for a while. Um, it's actually built around something called Tribes, which we 
have, dis well, we do dis distribute as a separate module um, through the, the central Maven repos. Some people do use it independently, um, but I'm not aware of any other Apache project using it, and I suspect, knowing the person that wrote it, that it was written from scratch rather than um, taking something that already existed. Um, there are other folks out there that have written their own um, sort of back ends to the clustering. Um, and I happen to know this through work, but the Gemfire folks have, have written the cluster managers. And oh, there's one who I really, sh the name really should be more to the front of my mind than it is. I'll, I'll go looking in the mailing list if it doesn't come to me. But there are other third party implementations of either the clustering module or Tomcat's session manager that then let you use um, third-party replication technologies to sort of replicate the session uh, data across a, a cluster. Uh, you talked previously um, about parallel deployments with the deployer. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to know if you could talk about uh, what, what, what's recommended for the clustering architecture, the requirements overall to implement something like that, and if you knew anybody in the industry that uses it on a larger scale. Okay, in and term, the challenges. Okay, right. In terms of um, the requirements for using that sort of parallel deployment with the deployer across a cluster, um, it's, it's a standard cluster setup. You just add the deployer tag into server.xml. That's all you need to do, uh, and set up a few directories on each of the nodes for the for the files to be dropped into, um, and it, it just works. In terms of people using it in production, I can't, honestly can't think of anybody. There are definitely people using it. What I'd have to do is go back through the mailing lists and see if the people that have been asking questions about it have done it with their work email address or a Gmail email address, and then we could take an educated guess as to which organizations might be using it. But beyond that, um, I'm not aware of anybody. And again, I would, my suspicion would be that in production, people would be more likely to um, manually copy the war files across uh, manually take nodes out of a cluster, update them, bring them back, then use, um, use the deployer. Chris. Um, I got a couple of questions as usual. Um, if you're using the backup manager, you may have actually mentioned this, but if a, if a backup node goes down, or if a node goes down that is the backup node for a mm -hmm. set of sessions, does the primary detect that and sort of Re-backup? Yes. Okay, so it yeah. rebalances itself. Yeah, so as soon as a node goes down, um, a, if, an, if, a, if another node is the primary, it selects a different backup. If the node that's gone down was its backup, it selects a new one. If it's the backup, it makes itself the primary and selects a new backup. So it does rebalance itself, and you end up with... Again, one node failed and a, a primary and a backup of every session across the cluster. And again, every node in the cluster knows where the new primary and the new backups are. They all have that coherent picture. Okay. Um, in a pathological case, if a, if a node were to um, think that it went down, like instead of actually a JVM crash or mm -hmm. you know, power goes out to the machine, uh, if instead you know, somebody unplugs the network cable, Mm -hmm. And so that machine is still running in its own little isolated world. It actually thinks that everyone else is down, yes. but that it's still up. So it's going to go crazy. The rest of the network is going to recover. Uh, what happens when you then rejoin it to okay, the Okay, well, the first thing that node is going to do is make itself the primary for all the sessions it knows about. Um, then when it rejoins, I honestly don't know what's going to happen. Um, well, it won't advertise that it is... It, I mean, it, you, it may try to it's, it's either going to get primary. very, very messy, <laughs> or I suspect what will happen is that there is some code in there for just to elect which one's the primary. Um, but I'd actually have to look at the source code to see how it handles that. Um, to be honest, working out how the, all the node handling failover works, that was a look at the source code. And it's actually pretty well commented and fairly clear what happens. But I don't remember considering that particular case, but we can have a look at the source code and find out. Okay. Um, also, you mentioned that um, y your send options uh, will configure how the replication is done for mm -hmm. a session, whether it's um, uh, you know, synchronous, asynchronous, uh, who you're waiting, what 
to lo what level of commit are you looking for from mm -hmm. uh, uh, from other members in the cluster? Is there any way to configure that on like either a per request or even a per URL pattern basis? Nope. Short answer. <laughs> okay. Now it, it's it's done at the cluster level. That's the only control you've got. Is there is there any reason? to suspect that that couldn't be built in? Is there something at a fundamental level that would make that difficult to do? Um, without looking at the code and seeing how far down sort of that level of acknowledgement goes, and in terms of synchronous and asynchronous, then yeah, there's a problem in that there's a fundamental difference between sending it and waiting for the response and sticking it on a queue. So that, that there's different components that get set up underneath that, but there's no reason that they couldn't exist in parallel. Um, in terms of how that flag is set on a per message basis, you would, what I don't know is whether or not that flag is, if that flag isn't transmitted with the message, then the other end is always gonna treat all messages the same way. So, yeah, I, I, you, I, that's a, I need to look at the source code again. Just, but in theory, it shouldn't be any worse than just adding another parameter to a, what's potentially a very long chain, chain of messages. Okay, because I can imagine an application where you're going through some workflow, maybe a 12-step workflow. The first 11 steps, you can be really sloppy about. But that last step, you need to make sure that it's committed and sent around to the cluster. and things. Yeah, like that. I, I think I'd, I'd be leaning heavily towards um, just persisting that to a database or something else in a transaction rather than Don't relying on the session replication. But yeah, I'm, here I am talking about clustering, trying to persuade as many of you as I can not to use it. Um, I think we're just about out of time, so I'll wrap it up there. If you've got any other questions, I'm around for the rest of the day. I'm around tomorrow and some of Thursday, so do come and find me. Hope you found that useful.